Jesus, you are here. Give us a measure of your spirit to have hearts ready to receive you, your word, and your new life. We ask this in your name. Amen. There was a fox, and he was going through an orchard. And he saw way up high this, this great cluster of grapes. And he thought to himself, this is exactly what I need to quench my thirst. But it was really high up there. And so he took a run and a jump, and he just missed biting into the grapes. Oh. So he turns back around. And with a one, two, three, he leaps up again, but still doesn't get it. And so again and again and again, he's trying, but he can't quite make the distance. And finally, he turns around and he, he trots away with his nose in the air, consoling himself by saying, the grapes were sour anyway. The expression, sour grapes, comes from Aesop's fable. Does the fox want the grapes? Of course. Are they sweet? You've got to know it. But he despises them. He holds them in contempt because he cannot have them. This story was told six, five hundred years before the birth of Jesus, and yet it still applies. It's still very contemporary because... We go through each season of life from young to old and there are these clusters and we try so hard. And you remember when you were just starting out, you're just trying to establish yourself and you're going to make a name for yourself. This weekend is state wrestling competitions. And and when I was in grade school, I thought I was going to be a state wrestler, you know, and take state. And, you know, and so you, you start off and, you, and you're, you're, you think you're going to do it and then you actually are part of the team and you get stuck to the mat and you get stuck to the mat. And you realize there's no matter how hard and high you're going to jump, you're not going to do it. Well, that's okay. There's another cluster of grapes. Maybe, it, maybe I'm not going to be a state wrestler, but maybe I can do really well in forensics, which is speech and drama kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and so I, I honed my skills, and, and yeah, I, I made state. And then it finally came time for the state competition of forensics, and, and I'm doing my thing, and, and, and then finally it's time to be judged, and, and now I make finals, and, and, and sixth place, and fifth place, and fourth, and I'm still standing there, and it comes down to first and second, and I got second. Which my son reminds me of what second place is. It's the first place loser. Yeah. Okay, fine. But there are so many more clusters of grapes, and, and we just keep leaping for them. You know, well, I'll make a name for myself as, in, in business, in school, I'll, in my neighborhood. I'll, I'll find the woman to marry, and, and finally, in all of these different clusters, sometimes we can reach them, and sometimes they're just out of reach. And so many of them are out of reach that... Even as a 47-year-old man, you're still looking back going, why wasn't I a first place? You know, you're still contemptuous against the clusters that you couldn't quite reach. You see, it's not just the seasons of life, but there are all kinds of grapes out there, and some of them are, have to deal with our family relationships. You know, as a parent, if, if you told a young couple that, okay, now this child that you're having, this, this little one you just love so much, you're going to worry about this child for the rest of your life. If, if parents knew that, I'm not sure they would have kids. Because you're thinking, oh, as, as a husband, as a, as a dad, you think, okay, we'll just get them out of the house and they're on their own. But that's not what moms say, right? No, oh, they, they worry about everything. And, and it just never stops. That that. That cluster of grapes is out of reach where they're just going to be okay because they're never going to be okay for everything. And then there are family relationships, you know, and you you think, well, you know, once we get past this, then things will be okay. And once we get past that, 
conflict, then we'll be okay. But the grapes are out of reach. They, they truly are too high for every one of us to get every cluster. And so we hold them in contempt. I didn't want them anyway, but they were sour. And we may not say this to ourselves, but we have a whole lot of other variations of sour grapes and, and holding these things in contempt because if we can't get the grapes, then we might just hold ourselves in contempt. Why aren't I fast enough, strong enough, smart enough, clever enough to get all the grapes that I want? Why can't I? And so each of these uh, grapes then, yeah, we, we find ourselves like the fox with our nose in the air. Now, we come to church though, and we find some comfort, some help in these contemptuous grapes and the problems of life and everything that's not working out. We, we come here and we think, well, I'll just, I will follow Jesus. You know, and I'll come to church and do the right things, and maybe the right things will start coming my way. And, and so we hear words like these from St. Paul. You know, we, we even glory in our sufferings. It's like, I, I can't reach all those grapes. Woohoo! You know, and it's a good thing. And here's why it's a good thing because, well, suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance is a good thing, right? But it's not done. Let it do all of its work. Perseverance produces character. Ooh, character sounds like a good thing. And then character produces hope. And hope, oh yes, does not disappoint us. And so we hear things like this in the church and we think, okay, in all these grapes that I'm trying to get in and all the difficulty and the sufferings of my life, it's, it's going to be okay. I've got this encouragement. It, it, but it all sounds kind of like one of those hang in there baby kitty posters, you know. It's just, that's about all the good it is because... You really want the grapes, you know? And, and, and no amount of just hang in there, baby, is really helping you get at them. You know, well, maybe you just need to try harder. Maybe you need to jump a little higher. But the reality is, somebody keeps moving the bunches. Somebody has placed the grapes beyond your reach, and it almost looks like it's intentional. Consider that for a moment. Who could have done that and why? You see, suffering does not have in its end goal. God has not placed these difficulties and struggles in your life so that you will finally learn something. So that you will finally see, oh, well, here's how, it's, how it all makes sense. You know, here, here's, here's the good that God's going to do out of the suffering. Yes, you may learn something in suffering. And yes, God may do some good things when it's all said and done. But really, that's why he brings suffering into your life? Couldn't he use some other things to teach you? Couldn't he still bring good things apart from suffering? No, there is a reason for suffering. And this is the reason. I've studied all the theology, all the religions of the world. And I have the answer. You ready for it? Here it is. I'm not God. Because if I was God, every branch would be right here and I could just take the grapes. Every family relationship that wasn't working out, I would just take the grapes and then there would be this great respect and harmony and love between all family members. And everything that I ever tried to do, well, I'd be able to accomplish it. If I was God, right? Suffering confronts us with the reality, and it's universal. Everybody, no matter what they believe, no matter who they are, what part of the country or the world they live in, is confronted with the reality, with suffering. Oh yeah, I'm not God. Well, that, that great epiphany and that, that great learning really just kind of depresses us. <laughs> it's like... Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so I'm not God, and there's still going to be suffering in the world, and, and it just kind of leads to a little more contempt. It's like, oh, wow, the grapes are just sour. And it wouldn't be all that helpful to know this unless we heard from Jesus. 
And we hear from Jesus today that he's going to suffer. He said, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the teachers of the law, and that he will be rejected and killed and after three days rise again. Okay, so I get it. I'm not God, and that's why they're suffering. But wait a minute. Jesus, you are God. Why, are, why do you have to suffer? You don't have to do or go through any of this. Why? And it is true, Jesus is the true Son of God, of the same substance, of the eternal, knowing everything, with the Father. But Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped like a bunch of grapes. But he made himself nothing taking on the form of a servant. And he humbled himself and even to the point of dying on the cross. Why? You see, it's true that you and I do not, you and I are not God. But the truth is, we have one. And Jesus goes the way of suffering to show us in all the detail, what kind of God that we have. He entrusted himself into the hands of God the Father. And so that the very worst would be done to him in this life and that all of his close family relationships, they would abandon him. His closest friend would deny that he even knew him. Another very close friend would betray him to death. Those who should be in the inner circle of the church and the worship life should have, who have, should have embraced him. Instead, they make fun of him. They spit on him. And they accuse him of all kinds of false allegations. And there in that false and, and, and everything that was wrong on that night, they placed him on the cross. And Jesus entrusts himself to his Father. He would endure all of this suffering and everything. Why? Because of what he believed, of what he trusted. My dad is good. My dad loves me. My dad will take care of me. He entrusted his life to the one who could save him and there made a way for the rest of us. It is Jesus who shows us most clearly that we are not God and we have one who is good and loving all the time. The God who came to Abram and said, you're no longer Abram, but you're Abraham, who has made an everlasting covenant to be your God is your God. And the sufferings that you and I go through in this life well, if you're not God, but you have one, then there, there is this perseverance in your endurance. As I am convinced with the faith of Jesus, as I see Him going through suffering, so there's a humility in me that I can go through whatever this life will bring to me because I have a really good dad, a father in heaven, who has filled me with his love, who has given me his promise to never leave or forsake me. I can wait on him. I don't have to have my time. I don't have to have my way. I don't have to be God. I just have to have one. And, and you do. I really have... Nothing more profound as a pastor to ever say to you or to myself other than what God has said to us right here. I'm yours, he says. And I love you. And I have you in my hand. And there will be these times in which you will need to persevere, but it begins to create in you a character. A character is repeated behaviors. Repeated behaviors in which begins to show what's on the inside of you. 
And what's on the inside of you is someone who's been filled with the love of God and who then trusts and believes that he is good all the time and he will never leave or forsake me. And no matter what I face in this life, he has me. You see, I, I've lost my life, but I have gained a life in Jesus. See, Jesus didn't stay dead. He entrusted his life to the one who can save him, and he was saved. Jesus was resurrected, and now he provides a way for us to live now forever, and it begins right now with this God, with our sins completely forgiven, with love completely filling us, and faith. You see, that's the reason hope doesn't disappoint us, because our God isn't disappointing he keeps his promises. He is faithful and true. He can be depended upon yesterday, today, and tomorrow to be exactly the same as he was to Abram, as he was there at the cross and empty tomb, as he will be right now and on that very last day. This is the hope that we encourage each other with. This is the only message that the church has. Our God reigns. He is with us and he loves us. Amen. We say back to him what 